Many thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and talk about what we've heard is an urgent topic. Uh, five years remain, and we're nowhere near reaching the Millennium Development Goals. By nowhere near, I mean according to the latest estimates, uh, it would take more than a century at current rates of progress to get to the goals that have been set. While there have been some remarkable examples of progress and limited successes in local settings, uh, the majority of the world's population is being left behind from development. So before I go into what I think are some strategies that could help us accelerate progress to the MDGs, I want to take a step back to look at their origins. Uh, who set them up? Uh, what was the plan? Who benefits? Um, one thing uh, that's noticeable is that these goals, the World Social Development Agenda, was largely set up by rich leaders of rich countries. Just like for the past 30 years, the dominant economic model, consensus model, has been the Washington consensus. To a great extent, the Millennium Development Goals represent uh, a consensus among high-income countries about what's good for social development. How were the goals set? When you look at some of them, reduce child mortality by two-thirds or maternal mortality by three-quarters, they have an air of scientific authority. But these goals were set more by a political process with a pinch of science. Uh, when you look at African countries' data, about only one-third of births or deaths are registered. So it's difficult to set targets where we have no data. Instead, what, what happened is uh, scientists looked at progress that was being made in high-income countries like the UK or the USA and saw, uh, over the past 15 years or so, child mortality's dropped by about two-thirds. That seems like a sensible target for the rest of the world. So what that means is high-income countries simply had to continue along the path they had followed and would achieve these goals, while developing countries would need a radical change in the way they were doing business to reach them. So what was the plan that we came up with to achieve this kind of radical shift uh, to, to meet these goals? Put simply, throw money at them. The World Bank and World Health Organization came up with a set of detailed packages of immunizations, low-cost, technological, cost-effective solutions that would solve the world's problems, magic bullets, and one fell swoop. Never mind what were the factors that got us in this mess in the first place. Um, and these packages, estimated uh, to cost around $120 billion in aid each year, um, were largely met. There was a gush of funding that came in from private foundations, like the Gates Foundation, from development agencies. It really did, as, as we heard, rally around these goals. Um, but uh, not just recipient communities stand to benefit. We also know there are ulterior motives to this, these mechanisms of aid delivery. If you look at Obama's global health policy that's coming out now, and it explicitly states that global health is an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. Food aid during the 60s and 70s was largely motivated around Cold War interests as part of an ideological struggle. When you look at the boards of private foundations, uh, the directors, very few of them, come from low-income countries. But they do represent boards of pharmaceutical companies, such as Merck, or food companies such as Coca-Cola. And many of their endowments are, in turn, invested in these companies, uh, which play a role in setting up their programs. So with this backdrop, it may not seem too surprising that we're sitting here asking whether uh, the MDGs are mission impossible. But I don't want to be too harsh. They've done a lot of good. Uh, they've been a rallying point. They've reminded countries that development is not just about economic growth. This may seem obvious to many of you. Um, but they legitimated interventions to focus on human well-being and development and help set up accountable goals that we can now try to hold country leaders to, private donors to, uh, and other agencies. When we look at the system that's been set up around achieving them, uh, there's been a lot of critiques. It's a mess. Um, aid is not well coordinated. Uh, it creates disruptions, as the likes of Bill Easterly and Dimbi Moyo point out. It stifles innovation uh, and, and local small-scale successes from being set up, experimented with, and replicated. And whatever your position is in the aid debate, when you read those arguments, uh, deep down, you'll know they have a point. Um, but I disagree fundamentally with their solutions about getting rid of aid. I think many of you might as well. Uh, we can find ways to make it work better 
by learning from our successes. Oxfam, for example, has detailed many of these. Um, but we also know that the current model of a big push charity-based aid to focus on the pottest solution of the day uh, to, to get mass nutrition out uh, to people hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked in spite of getting the money we thought was necessary uh, to achieve it is a major question. And to try to reconcile and save the current model, there have been two lines of uh, attack coming out in the literature. And one has been to blame corrupt governments, which is a usual story, and a new one has been to blame donors. So, um, as an example, for each dollar of aid, that, say I go to a charity and want to get a dollar out to health, a health system, about 40 cents makes it. Uh, the rest is being found to be diverted to reserves, military spending, or perhaps going into some crony's pocket, um, or displacing government spending that would have gone into the system otherwise. That's a corrupt government one. The other is private donors of whimsical, they change their minds, they, they go with the fashion of the day, setting up poorly designed programs, and then cutting the budget, moving on to something else. And this leaves countries hanging. There's a kernel of truth in that story, but it's only part of the picture. Um, it's a particularly convenient story for external agencies that are driving the financial agenda. One of these is the International Monetary Fund, who argues that because aid is volatile, that the money should be deserted, diverted to reserves. Uh, often, or at least in the past, has placed caps on the growth of health and education setting to solve uh, many of the Millennium Development Goals. And one of the studies we did, we found that if you give a dollar uh, to health when a country is borrowing from the International Monetary Fund, none of it makes it. It's either diverted to reserves or completely displaces government spending. So that dollar you gave just ends up transferring authority from countries themselves to uh, external agencies. Um, we're also seeing that the current big push model is being threatened by disasters, uh, natural ones such as the tsunami in East Asia, or more recently the earthquake in Haiti, but also a series of man-made disasters like the financial crisis or the food price bubble that arose largely out of speculative investment. Um, so we're, we're confronting the reality that we're being permanently set back by temporary crises and disasters, some of which are of our own making. So looking forward, I believe there's a third way then to continue to drum on that we need more money, we have low cost effective solutions available, or to get rid of it. I would say the solution is not to get rid of it, not to seek a temporary dose, but to try to bolster systems of social welfare, make them more reliable, publicly accountable, and give a voice to the people who need it most. Some of our greatest successes in health come in the form of permanent reliable aid, such as the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria. Now, the system is not complicated. They provide basic things. They pay for doctors, they build clinics, uh, and they dole out medicines. That's what we mean by health system strengthening. Uh, but they also happen to face the biggest backlash from those who wish to get rid of aid. HIV uh, as a social movement is coming under a lot of attack for being the problem rather than the solution. But the Global Fund also sets up a powerful precedent. It secures human rights. It secures access to care. We can attempt to scale up the remit of the Global Fund to build global social protection. We've set up protections within our borders, but those social protections are no match for today's threats, which are truly global. So I would advocate for global social protection. We should also try to get back to basics. We've heard some of them. Uh, development uh, at a most fundamental level that you learn about in grade school is about adequate food, clean water, safe shelter, and good jobs. Often we're lured into sexy goals. In HIV, one day it was condom use. Uh, for a time it was mass circumcision. Now it's antiretrovirals. Uh, we, we have many solutions available to us. We know what to do. Many of the programs are rather basic, but not so sexy. Who will want to fund them? Um, we're happy to provide engineered cheap computers, but forget that systems of public taxation that can provide consistent education to a population and build basic infrastructure is deeply needed. I, I don't know about you, but when I came into development, I didn't want to be an accountant. I wasn't very interested in taxes. But I'm coming to realize that these basic financial needs are essential and have largely been overlooked. Um, I could keep going to spell out more specific strategies, but I, I realize I only have 10 minutes, so I'd like to keep the discussion going and turn over to Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you.